Good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning at Trinity and welcome. My name is DJ. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity and this morning it is my privilege to get to open God's word and lead us in our study of it. So if you have a copy of the Bible this morning, I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 12 this morning looking at verses 43 through 50. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, um, there should be one on one of the seat racks in the row in front of you. We'll have the text up on screen uh, and then we've got a listening guide as well that has the text printed in it. So if you didn't get a listening guide on your way in and you would like one, it's a little piece of paper. It has the text printed. It's got some space to take notes and help you follow along. Uh, If you didn't get one on the way in and you like one, just slip your hand up and someone will come down from the back and make sure that you get one uh, and can help you follow along in our study of Matthew's gospel. Here at Trinity, uh, we love the Bible. Uh, We believe the Bible is how God speaks to us. It's how he tells us who he is. It's how he tells us who we really are. And it's how we learn how we should relate to him. And so we want to study it systematically, week by week, open it up and learn what it has to say to us. And most often, our practice is to open a book of the Bible and just walk through it paragraph by paragraph, verse by by verse, and understand uh, what it means in its original context to the people who would have originally heard it. We unpack that and then we apply it to our lives today. And right now that has us going on a journey through Matthew's gospel. It is a story of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we're right smack dab in the middle of it this morning as we continue closing chapter 12 today, looking at verses 43 and 50. So as you find your place there in Matthew's gospel, uh, we're going to be talking this morning and to set the table, I want to talk a little bit about home redecoration and home renovation. So if you turn on the TV these days, uh, shows that are about renovation and redecoration of the home are massively popular, right? You've got a whole network in HGTV that is pretty much all about this stuff, any flavor of, of redecoration and renovation you can possibly imagine. Uh, and there's a couple different spins on this kind of show, a couple different spins on the concept, and some of them are really involved and some are a little bit less involved. So on the one hand, you have shows that aim for more of a simple redecoration. And when I think about this, I think of really the first show of this type that I remember kind of breaking these things into popularity was a show from about 15, 20 years ago called Trading Spaces. Anybody remember Trading Spaces? I know you do. So Trading Spaces was a show where you would have two sets of neighbors and they would essentially swap homes for a couple of days. They had an interior designer and a carpenter and a pretty modest budget. I think it was $1,000 was the budget. $5,000? Five hundred dollars, so even less. So they had a really modest budget. It's great my wife is here to help me with these things today. And they would each redecorate a room in their friend's home, and then it would be a surprise two days later when the friends come back and they see that in just two days on a pretty modest budget, what they had accomplished in the new room that they had given, and the results were often really impressive. But given the fact they only had two days, and given the fact that they only had five hundred dollars we're talking more redecoration, not renovation. Like, it was always the same house that they came back to, just overhauled and and represented. Now, contrast that with a lot of the shows that are popular today on HGTV that blow that concept right out of the water. I think of, like, something like Property Brothers. And if you watch Property Brothers, one of the two brothers that hosts the show is a contractor. So, He is adept at knocking down walls, at ripping out carpet and flooring and installing new light fixtures and all this stuff. And so they've got a substantial renovation budget. And usually the work on the show takes place over weeks, maybe even months. And so the property that they pick out at the beginning of the show and what it looks like at the end of the show are often completely different. I mean, they have gutted the place and presented something that looks fantastic and new and is altogether different. So that spectrum of redecoration versus renovation is going to be helpful to us this morning as we think about the idea of life change. So as we've read through Matthew's gospel, you don't have to get very far into Matthew's gospel before you realize Jesus came to change things, right? Jesus doesn't just leave the status quo there. He came to change things. And in particular, he came to change lives, to transform people uh, into be more like him, more like the image of God. And so when he does this, when he transforms and changes lives, we're going to have a couple exchanges in the text today to help us understand what kind of life changes Jesus after. Is it more redecoration or is it more renovation? How drastic is the work that Jesus came to do? 
And as we look at these two examples, as we look at these two exchanges, I think what we'll find very clearly is that when it comes to our lives, simple redecoration just will not do. Jesus came in order to renovate us. Jesus came in order to take us down to the studs and completely rebuild us from the ground up. So we're, let's look at Matthew, 40, uh, Matthew 12, 43 through 50, and we'll see how this idea of renovation will take place and what it would look like in our lives today. So starting in verse 43, it says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. Now, while he was speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. That's God's word for us this morning. Let's pray and we will start to unpack it together. Our God and and good and gracious Father, as we come to your word this morning and as we seek to understand and apply it, we ask that what we know not you would teach us, what we have not you would give us, and ultimately what we are not you would make us by your Spirit's power to the praise of your glorious grace. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we are jumping into Matthew's gospel. Let's let's start out by considering the context of where we're at. Where do we leave off next week, and how does that inform where we pick up this week? So last week, we saw Jesus sharply rebuke the skepticism of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And this was not just a a basic healthy skepticism. This was a skepticism that had grown to ridiculous proportions, where they're demanding he perform a sign to validate who he is, all while they're ignoring all the signs that he's performed along the way. They're shutting their eyes. They're doing the ostrich thing, sticking their head in the ground. And Jesus said, this is not how this is going to go. So he's continuing to clash with these Pharisees, with these religious leaders, the spiritual giants of his day. And and he tells them that on the day of judgment, their spiritual pedigree is going to mean nothing. And Gentile outsiders, the people that these religious leaders would look at as the others, the outsiders, the people who aren't important, those people are going to be standing on God's side, looking down on them in judgment at their lack of faith and their failure to respond to Jesus as he comes into the world. And then suddenly he makes these remarks here in verses 43 through 45 about this unclean spirit goes out of a person. It passes through waterless places. It looks for rest. It finds none. It says, hey, I'm going to go back home to my place where I was and bring seven other evil spirits with me. And they destroy this individual's life. And if you're like me, you pass from what we read last week and you pick up verse 43 and you might find yourself thinking, huh? Like, how, how do we get from 42 to 43. What's, what's the connection? Because this feels just very like plopped in there. It feels very out of context. It feels difficult to wrap our minds around why is Jesus saying this. So it's kind of connecting things back to the first part of this chapter. So even before the exchange with the Pharisees, remember what prompted that exchange? Well, the exchange was prompted by the fact that Jesus had cast an, an evil spirit, a demon out of somebody who had been tormented by it. And the Pharisees see it And they dismiss it as, well, yeah, you did that, but you did it by demonic power yourself. And Jesus, that's kind of the the instance that prompts Jesus to say, you guys are just completely missing the boat. You're blind to it. This is ridiculous. And so he kind of calls back to that exchange that had just happened in verse 22 of this chapter. And we can think of other instances in Jesus' ministry where we see him casting out demons from people, helping people who were oppressed by evil spirits. And in this story... What Jesus describes and appears to be a great change actually ends up turning out surprisingly badly, right? This person that he, that Jesus tells this story about ends up worse than he started out. So this demon gets cast out of somebody in verse 33, doesn't find anywhere else to go in verse 44. And so it says, I'm going to go back and it goes back and it finds its old place empty, swept, put in order, all cleaned up, right? Life changes happened here. This individual has gotten their life together. They've got it in order. And the demon says, 
this is great. Everything's cleaned up. Housekeeping's been here. I can move right back on in. So not only does it move back in, it calls seven of its friends, seven evil spirits worse than it is, and they all come and move in together. And Jesus says, and the, the last state of this person is worse than the first state of this person. So what we find here, what's the lesson in this is this, simply cleaning things up isn't good enough. All right, that's the point that Jesus is making here. Simply cleaning things up isn't good enough. Surface changes don't transform the heart. Right, Jesus is telling a story of somebody who experiences a good change, who gets their life in order, but it's not enough to last. It doesn't hold up down the road. He's getting the point across that, that just thinking we got to clean our lives up isn't going to be enough. And why is he bringing this up here? Why does he tell this story here? Why make this point here? Well, ask yourself, who was really, really good at cleaning things up, at cleaning their lives up? Well, the Pharisees. That was their whole mode of operation. That's what they lived. That's what they taught to their disciples was you've got to follow the laws rigorously. You've got to get your life in order. You've got to be good enough to merit the favor of God. And so Jesus clashes with them time and time again where he says, you get half the equation right, guys, but you miss the whole point. It's not enough to just clean your life up, to follow the rules, to follow the laws, and think you can work your way up to God. You need to have your heart transformed. You need to have your life transformed. You need to know the heart of God and why you follow these rules, why you follow these laws. In Matthew 23, so jumping ahead several chapters, Jesus is going to basically go on a a tirade that we call the woes, and he's going to tell the Pharisees in very explicit terms exactly what their problem is. And here's what he says in Matthew 23, verses 25 through 28. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, then the outside also can be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and pall uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's why Jesus tells this story right here, right now, to this audience, right? So he says at the end of verse 45, so also will it be with this evil generation. He's addressing the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and their followers, their disciples. And he's saying this this product or this process of cleaning up the outside, you like to wash the outside of the cup, you like to paint the outside of the tomb, it doesn't cut it. Because ultimately you're left with a house that's put in order for a time. But just simple redecoration of the furniture is not going to last. It's not going to accomplish the change and the transformation that you're looking for, that you're trying to achieve. These religious leaders and their, and their disciples are going to great lengths to get everything all cleaned up about their lives, right? They're following every last detail of the law, and then they're making up new details to follow that God didn't even mention. And all they end up accomplishing if I'm going to paraphrase Jesus here, all they're ending up accomplishing accomplishing is being the best upper-class demon neighborhood on realtor.com, right? They're a really great place for an evil spirit to move in because they've got all the externals cleaned up, but their heart is still cold and dead. They haven't embraced the God who gives these laws, who gives these rules and regulations. So the principle underlying the passage is this, just getting rid of sin and wrongdoing is not enough to transform one's life. Evicting the old tenant of your heart isn't good enough unless somebody new moves into the house. Somebody new takes over. Think about it this way. I want you to imagine for a moment that you have to move to a new city for your job. You get a new opportunity and you're going to be moving a couple states away. And so you put your house on the market, right? You try to sell your house. But unfortunately, the market's not great. Your house doesn't sell uh, after the first couple of months and it's time to move. Well, your company's got a great relocation package. So they are able to pay for your move and you're able to just go ahead and move without waiting on your house to sell. So you go to the new city. All the while, your house still sits on the market back home. And you go to this new city and honestly, after the first year, you don't really like it there. The job's not quite what you thought it would be. The city is just too different than what you're used to. And you decide, 
you know, I, I don't really like it here. And you get an opportunity after a year to, move, to go back home, to move back to your old city. And you say, I'm going to take it. I'm going to go back. And your house is never sold. So that makes things really easy, right? Because you can just move right back into your old house because there's nobody there. It's still your house. And it makes things very simple to complete that move. Now, let's say for it, it, that your house had sold. That after about six months in the new city, you do sell your house, it's great, you move on, but then you decide you're going to move back home. Can you move back into your old house? No, it's a little complicated now. Why? Because somebody else lives there. Now that somebody else lives there, you can't just move right back on in. And so as you look at this, as we draw near to God, as we want to become more like God, as we want to change our lives Drawing near to God involves the owner of the house of our hearts moving out, right? That we, the, the person who's in charge of the way that I live and think and act is gone. And the Bible says that that owner of our hearts is the devil. It's Satan. And that's a little bit shocking to us because we might think, well, I'm not like worshiping Satan. I'm not, I'm not a follower of the devil. I'm not a particularly evil person, right? But the Bible makes it pretty clear that in our natural state, the natural human state, the natural human reality and condition is that we follow the devil's way of doing things. We follow the way of the, that the world likes to do things. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3 says this. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul's talking to these Christians at Ephesus, and he says, all of us were once like this. We followed the way of the world. We followed the way of the world, which ultimately is the devil's way of doing things, a way that says you follow self, you do what you want to do, and don't worry about who else it hurts, who else's way you get in the way of, you do what you want. That's, That's who we are. And so if we're going to be transformed, sometimes we think, okay, if I just run out the old owner of the house and clean things up, I'm going to be fine. I'm in good shape. That's what religion is after, all right? It's just, it's getting rid of the bad things that I do. It's trying harder to be a good person, to be like God wants me to be, to be like Jesus wants me to be. That, that's what religion is. That's what Christianity is, isn't it, right? That's the, that's the lie that we embrace, that it's just about cleaning up my life. But Jesus tells us that even if we run the old master of the house out, he'll eventually come back. He'll eventually move back in, and he'll eventually move back in stronger unless a new master takes up residence in the heart. Unless somebody else moves in and takes over, you've still got a vacancy there, and that vacancy will eventually be filled. So these Pharisees and religious leaders, they were trying to run the old tenant out by rigorously following the law, but they had no new tenant. They had no relationship with God, right? They thought they did. They would say, we're, we're being very religious. We know the Bible. We know all these things. But ultimately, they don't know God because they don't understand the heart of God that gave these laws, these rules, these regulations. They've got the letter. They don't have the spirit. And when God himself shows up in the flesh in the person of Jesus, they don't even recognize him. They don't know God. And it shows that even though they've run the old tenant out, Nobody new has moved in. God has not taken up residence in their hearts. Now, maybe you've tried the same thing. Maybe you have things in your life that you wish were different, patterns of living that you know are wrong, that bring you guilt, that you want to change, and maybe you tell yourself over and over, I'm going to change, I'm going to change, I'm going to change. And maybe sometimes you do well and things seem good, but it always seems empty. It always seems hollow, and it seems like an eternally uphill battle. The message of our text this morning is you don't need to just get rid of those patterns of living. You need to fill the vacuum left by them with a relationship with Jesus Christ. You need someone new to move into the house of your heart and rebuild the place. Take it down to the studs. I want to give you a couple of quotes from pastor and author John Piper. He's kind of trying to illustrate this this uh, idea of we can't just empty out the heart, we've got to fill it with something else. 
He says, if you had access to all the latest machinery in a sophisticated science lab, what would be the most effective way to get all the air out of a glass beaker? One can ponder all the possible ways to suck the air out of the beaker and create a vacuum. So imagine you're in the science lab, you've got a glass beaker, and you're given the challenge, get all the air out of it, out of it in the most effective way possible. And you're thinking, well, I could hook up a pump, and then I could, when I get the pump off of it, I pop a stopper in there, and it creates a vacuum, and I get all the air out of it, all these different ways of doing things. But Piper says, eventually, the answer to the riddle is given. The most effective way to get all the air out of the beaker fill it with water. If you fill it with water, there's no more air, right? If you fill it with water, all of the air that was there is displaced, and now you have a beaker of water. You don't have a beaker of air anymore. And the air is not going to push its way back in. So even if, let's say that I am able to suck all the air out of the beaker and create a vacuum, as soon as there's the slightest opening, what's going to happen? Air is going to rush back in and fill it up. But when you fill it with water... That water's not going anywhere, and there's no space for the air to come in and take over. Piper explains the reason he tells that story is this. He says, the most effective way to kill our own sin is by the power of a superior pleasure. The most effective way to kill our own sin is by the power of a superior pleasure. No one sins out of duty. We sin because it's more pleasant or less painful than the way of righteousness. So bondage to sin is broken by a stronger attraction, by a more compelling joy. The idea is not to just suck all the air out of the beaker, fill it with something that will last. And Jesus is saying, that thing that will last is me, is a relationship with the Father who created you, who loves you, and who wants to transform you into his image, into the image of Jesus Christ, his son. Don't waste all your energy trying to clean up the mess and clear out the mess that's in your own heart because something else will fill it in time. Instead, fill your heart with a relationship with this Jesus Christ and watch all those other things get pushed out in the process, get displaced just like that water filling the beaker displaces all of the air but it's a change that is lasting that sticks that's the message of verses 43 through 45 but then we get another abrupt change in verse 46 don't we another one of those moments where just as we're starting to wrap our mind around what we have now we're on to something else that that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of connection verse 46 we're told while jesus is still speaking and explaining these things his mother and his brothers Come, out, come up and they want to talk to him. He has some surprise visitors. He has his, mo- his mother and his brothers that would like a word. Now, in the text, we don't really have any indication why they're coming to talk to him. Like, are they making dinner plans? What, what's going on here? We, we, don't, we don't know. We're not told. But what we know from other pieces of the gospel accounts is that at this stage in Jesus's life and ministry, his mother and his brothers by the way, notice that Joseph, his, his earthly father, is not mentioned. Scholars think he's probably dead at this point because he doesn't show up in any of the, in any of the stories where family comes in. But we're, what we're told is that Jesus' mother and his brothers are not on board with his mission at this point in his life. They don't understand what's going on. In fact, they think he's crazy. Mark chapter 3, which is a, an account that comes from a similar point in time than our story today, says, then Jesus went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying, he's out of his mind. So Jesus is just trying to have dinner. The crowds are rushing in. They want to talk to him. They want to see healings and miracles. They can't even eat. There's so many people around. And so finally, Jesus' mother and brothers say, all right, we've seen enough of this. It's time to come home. You're, You're nuts. You're crazy. They don't understand why he's doing what he's doing. So it's likely when they show up here in verse 46, they're probably trying to, or they're probably coming to try to talk sense into him again, to help him to understand, hey, quit clashing with these Pharisees. You're going to get yourself killed. You're going to get yourself in trouble. They're not on board with his mission. And so they show up, verse 46, and they ask to speak to him. Now, before we go any further, we got to do one little bit of housekeeping here because 
If you're observing keenly, you might notice something strange here if you're reading from the English Standard Version, which is the version that that I'm using, the version that uh, is in your listening guide as well. And that is this. You probably have a question. Where's verse 47? So verse 46, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. And then it goes to verse 48. Where's verse 47? Now I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes answer, the short version of the answer, because ultimately it doesn't really impact our understanding of the text that we have today. But it's worth at least pointing out what happened to verse 47. So verse 47, if you have another version of the Bible that does have verse 47 in there, it basically is just a connecting verse. It says, someone came and told Jesus that his mother and brothers want to talk to him, right? So in verse 46, we learn they're there, and they're asking to speak to him, to someone in the crowd. Verse 47, that's not in the ESV, says, and someone came and told Jesus, so he would know. But if we look at the, the earliest copies of Matthew's gospel that we have, Verse 47 is not there. That line about someone coming to tell Jesus isn't in the text. And so what scholars who have, who have translated and assembled the Bible have come to, to figure out is if the earliest copies we have don't have that verse in it, then it's likely Matthew didn't write that verse and someone added it in as an editorial comment later on to explain how Jesus found out about his mother and brothers there. But the ESV translators, because it's not, because from what we can tell, it's not something Matthew originally wrote, they left it out. And you have a note probably in your Bible, if you have an ESV, that explains it's not in the earliest manuscripts, so we didn't include it in here. And that's why you go from verse 46 to 48. Now, if that idea is something that's really troubling to you, or you've got questions about it, when you want to talk deeper about, you know, how do we get from manuscripts and text to our version of the Bible today, um, come talk to me after the service. Come talk to Pastor Dave. We'd love to have a conversation and, and explain more about why the Bible is reliable and, and how we go about receiving the copy that we have. But for our purposes today, just know that whether verse 47 is there or whether it's not, it doesn't change anything about how we understand the text. It doesn't change the meaning. It doesn't change our grasp of what's going on. So that's why at this one bizarre spot in the Bible, you go from 46 to 48. There you go. Now, back to the the question at hand. So how does Jesus respond to his family intervention, right? How does Jesus respond when mom and his brothers show up? When verse 48 what he essentially says is, what do you mean my mother and brothers want to talk to me? My mother and brothers are right here, right? He, he responds in a way that's surprising. He replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward the disciples, he says, here are my mother and my brothers. Essentially what's going on is he says the people who have come to him in faith right, what he's going to call the people who do the will of his Father in heaven. The people who come to him in faith are more closely tied to him than his earthly blood relatives. What's essentially going on is his biological mother and brothers are trying to pull rank, right? Jesus is surrounded by a crowd of people. They come up and they say, excuse me, we need to talk to him with the assumption that because they're his relatives, they get a spot in the front of the line. And what Jesus is saying is, is they don't have any rank to pull. They're not any closer, more special, more important than any of the people who have come and who are following me. Now, like many other things Jesus said and did, this would have been shocking in his cultural context, right? Family ties were everything in the ancient Near Eastern culture. And so to say that these people who are following me are of more value and importance than even my own blood relatives People would have thought, that's crazy talk. What, are you, what exactly are you saying here, Jesus? But Jesus consistently says this. Jesus in his teaching consistently says that what I'm building, this kingdom that I'm building, is something that is more intimate and more close and more special than even your closest earthly relationships. Matthew 10, verse 36 through 39, going back just a couple chapters, remember Jesus was warning his disciples, he said, a person's enemies will be those of his own household. And whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This radical redefinition 
of what it's going to look like to follow Jesus. He says, some, ta- some of you are going to be opposed by members of your own family. And if you choose them over me, you're not worthy of me. What kind of person says this? No mere human teacher, but someone who is God in the flesh. And then Mark 10, 29 through 30, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So Jesus consistently says, for some of you, following me is going to cost you your family because they're not going to be on board with this new version of you that's created. They're not going to be on board with Jesus and his kingdom. And that, when that happens, your allegiance has to be to Jesus and not to your family. And that's an earth-shattering deal in Jesus' culture. That's an earth-shattering deal in our culture where Jesus says, the transformation that I'm looking to bring into your life is so massive that it's deeper than even the closest family tie. That's what he's saying to them. Now, he's not saying family means nothing at all, right? He's not saying, forget those losers and you just come follow me. Because we see elsewhere in the Bible calls to serve your family, to love your family, how to be a godly husband, how to be a godly wife, how to be a godly parent, how to be a godly kid. And we even see a warning in 1 Timothy 5, 8, where Jesus is talking about providing for one's relatives, particularly elderly relatives. He says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So Jesus isn't saying here, just forget your family, they don't matter anymore. But what he is saying is, when you come to a point, and some of you might have to, where you have to choose between following your family and following Jesus, you choose Jesus. That's the ultimate allegiance. He is claiming a place of ultimate importance. And in some cases, that's going to drive your family further away. In some cases, it might be the very thing that gets your family's attention and draws them to Christ. Because in Acts 1.14, we're told, and this is after Jesus' death, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven, we're told all of these, all the disciples with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Jesus' mother and his brothers end up understanding. They end up joining the crowds. They end up joining the church. They end up joining Jesus' people. But they didn't get it in the early days, and Jesus didn't bow to their wishes. He stayed on his mission. Now consider the contrast between the two texts we've just looked at. The Pharisees were pursuing a superficial righteousness that cleans things up without really transforming a person on the inside. And Jesus is saying, you're setting yourself up for failure. Jesus says here in these latter verses that the change he's come to bring will so fundamentally transform us that it even pulls rank over the most deeply held relationships we can imagine. When you take these two texts in tandem, they begin to drive home the point. When Jesus renovates a life, there is nothing superficial about it. This is no mere redecoration. It's no low budget, let's see if we can rearrange the furniture and make things a little more pleasant. Everything changes when Jesus gets a hold of someone. Everything changes. Your allegiance, your affections, your life, the things that you do, they change too. The Pharisees had it partly right. They had the rules. They had the life change. There are things in your life that are going to be different that you're not going to do anymore. But they have to be accompanied by a heart that's been transformed, that grasps who God is, the wonder of his love for us, and allows that God, that Savior, to transform us and make us look more like him. Everything is made new. The the type of life change that Jesus came to bring is a life change that takes us down to the studs, and completely rebuilds us. You're still you. You still have your personality. God will use your personality in a way that he won't use me because we're different people and we retain those differences and those unique traits. But Jesus is going to rebuild everything about you. He's going to transform and change you so that you look less like you and more like him. So what do we do with this text? 
Well, let me ask a couple questions. If your life and your faith is a house on an HGTV show, what kind of show is it? What kind of renovation project is it? Is it a simple cleanup and redecorating? 500 bucks? Or is it a renovation project that will take you down to the studs? Are you prepared to have Jesus take the keys and completely rebuild you? No questions asked. Or do you still want to keep things kind of like they are, kind of safe, kind of comfortable, kind of what you know? I think all of us who are following Christ would say, well, I fit somewhere on that spectrum. Here's the more likely thing. There's probably some rooms that you're okay with Jesus completely tearing out. But there might be that one room that you think, but this one's mine. This one you don't get the keys to. This one, I'm going to get it cleaned up and I'm going to take care of it, but I'm not ready for it to be completely flipped upside down because I want to hold on to some semblance of control here. In what specific areas of your life, Christian, are you content to just tidy up when Jesus wants to knock down walls and transform the entire flow of the house? Ask yourself that this week as you think about what, in what areas do I need the kind of change that can only happen through God doing something drastic in my heart, doing something drastic in my life? And then final question, have you been trying to manage the construction project that is your life on your own? Maybe you think, you know what, I am doing things a lot more like these religious leaders. I'm trying to sweep, I'm trying to clean, I'm trying to get myself in order. But God, I I haven't really established a relationship with God. I haven't really encountered this guy, Jesus. I've heard about Jesus, but this guy seems different than what I thought. I want to know more about him. My question for you is, will you come to the master builder and finally embrace real change? Will you come to a savior who says, I'm not going to just tidy up, tweak a couple things about your life and send you on your way. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to build you up from the inside out. I'm going to transform not only your actions, not only your words, but your loves, your allegiances, your affections, your desires, your passions, because I'm not just going to give you a set of rules to follow. I'm going to transform you to have my heart. That's Jesus's goal, to make us look more like him. He came, he lived, he died for all of our mess, for all of our mistakes, to pay the penalty that we deserve. But he didn't just come to free us from those things so that we basically get to start back at zero and try again to live a good life. He came to change us, to transform us, to move in, to be that new tenant, to be the water in the beaker that doesn't let the air come back in. He came to transform our hearts and everything about us. Do you know Jesus in that way? If you would say, no, I don't, after the service, come talk to me, talk to Pastor Dave, talk to the friend that brought you, and let's let's start a conversation. about What does following this Jesus mean? What does it look like? It is a change. It is a transformation. It is a renovation that you will never forget, right? There's another show on HGTV called Love It or List It, right? Where people are trying to decide, do I want to move out and get a new house or do I want to renovate my own? And on the show, they do both. They renovate their own house. They go look at new houses. And at the end of the show, when they see the finished renovation, they decide, am I going to love it and stay here? Or am I going to list it, put it up for sale, and go move into this new house that I found? I promise you, uh, 100%, if you meet Jesus Christ, if he begins to transform your life, you're not going to list it. It's not something that you're going to say, eh, that was kind of nice, but I'm going to go look for something new. This Jesus is a good savior, a good brother, a good friend. And the kind of transformation he brings is the kind that your heart was created to experience and to enjoy forever. So as we walk through this week, and as we experience the changes that we know we need to take place in our lives, let's do it the right way. Let's let Jesus take us down to the studs and not just rearrange the furniture, waiting to go back to our old ways. Let's pray.